As we continue our series of sermons in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon here is the preacher. And as you're turning there, I want to welcome those who are watching via Facebook or social media. We welcome you to our morning worship service, Blessed Hope Missionary Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida, Ed Incorporated. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, starting with verse 9, and when you have it, Please stand for the reading of the word as I read aloud, read along with me in your Bible silently. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're going to start reading with verse number 9. I know my wife probably going to get on me because I know she's watching. Did anybody notice the difference in the program this morning? Yeah, she's in it. The first lady's uh, pen there. Y'all didn't see it, y'all. Y'all missed it. Y'all need to check that out. So she even leaves her mark. When she's not even, not even here, she did a good job on changing the colors, and she wrote up the um, the pen for the day she wrote. So I got to give glory to her for the writing of the pen this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter eight verse nine, and it says, "In all this have I seen, and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun." There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. Verse 11 says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that if, if it shall be well with them that fear God with fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth that there be just men upon whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happened according to the work of the righteous. I say that this also is vanity. Then I commended murder because a man has no better thing under the sun, no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God has given under the sun. Verse 16 says, When I applied my heart to know wisdom, to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because afore thou, although a man labor to seek it out, yea, he shall not find it. Yea, father, uh, further, or uh, though a wise man think he knows it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Let us pray. Father God, we again come before your throne of grace and mercy. And you said we ought to come with, with boldness. Father, come now and let our petitions be made known unto you. We thank you again for this opportunity to be in your house of, of worship. We thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for waking us up and starting us on our way. We thank you for life, health, and we thank you for strength. We thank you for life. We thank you for being a wonderful God, a gracious God. And Father God, we pray for those now who around this world that are sick. We pray for your healing mercy that's extended to each one of them. And then too, Father, we pray for our very own First Lady as she's home. Father God, we pray for her that you will uh, prop her up 
when she build her up, when she's torn down. We pray for healing and we pray for your mercy on her. We pray that you will strengthen her, that she can stand and that she can do your will. Father God, we take this situation that we're in and we, we bring it to the foot of the cross. And we lay it down at your feet because we know that you're God that can do all things above anything that we can imagine or that we can think. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You're everywhere present, Lord. So we thank you now. As we come to the point of the service where we break the bread of life, I pray now that you will lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom, that you will anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. You will give me preaching power from on high, that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase, that they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you and thank you, and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. That will give me a little bit on this, on this mic, a little bit of power. I, I want to use for a subject this morning the perplexities uh, of life. The perplexities of life. This is part 14 under our series of sermons, Life under the sun. Solomon here is the coalesce. Solomon is the preacher. Solomon is addressing the congregation. Solomon has lived a pretty long life. He lived a prosperous, good life. Solomon is at the end of his life. He's an aged man now. And Solomon is kind of like reflecting back over his life at some of the, the good times, the bad times, some of the mistakes that he made to give us what I think is just an encouraging word. Solomon, we know, as God gave him a blank check and asked him, Solomon, what is it that you want? And Solomon said, it's give me wisdom. In order for me to guide my people, said Solomon didn't ask for wealth and, and mansions and houses. God gave him wisdom as well as wealth. So we know that Solomon here is one of the wisest men that ever walked this earth as well as one of the richest. But now Solomon moves here as he looks at life. Solomon did an investigation, found out that apart from God, uh, life is empty, it's vain, it's meaningless, and it's void. Solomon here moves to the perplexities of of life and there are some things in life that man just can't understand it goes far beyond our our comprehension if all of us can just take a moment and think something has come across in your life where you just couldn't fathom why it happened there is no comprehension there is no understanding things happen in life that we just do not understand some things in life even based on education we still don't, don't, don't understand. We still don't have a clue. But when we see God's control, God gives us hope that we can cope with whatever problem that we have. Knowing that we understand that God is the one that's in control, that ought to give us some silence, some hope to cope with whatever issue that's going on in your life. Whether it's finances, whether it's a sickness in your body, whether we're dealing with this virus, to know that God is in control, that ought to give us some hope to cope with the problem and the issues of, of life. Amen. It takes God's wisdom in us to see life and to handle the problem and the issues of, of life with the with the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. It takes God's wisdom in order for us to deal with this situation. you got folks today that's mouthing off, don't even know what they're talking about. Half of the folks that are doing all the talking as concerning, as concerning the church are the ones that don't even go to church, but yet they're the ones that got to say so and how we ought to operate. Yeah. See, we, we got we, we got to have godly wisdom to handle problems in this in this world. Amen. See, God, and we often ask the question, why does God allow things like this to happen? Not not that we question God, but sometimes you may ask, you know, why is do we have this now? Why did this did this 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 happen? We see our young people on a daily basis dying and you may sit at the graveside and ask the question why 
why this innocent young not even started to live life yet already life has ended sometimes we get in situations that we can't comprehend we don't understand but yet we simply ask why so many sit here and try to resolve issues without godly wisdom and we know that wisdom is not something that we read in the book Wisdom is something that God gives you. Don't come with the sea bag. Wisdom don't come with, with life. Wisdom don't come with uh, how many years you, you walked on this earth. Wisdom comes as you ask God. And James said he will give it to you unbraidedly. That means unlimited wisdom if you ask God for it. But notice the perplexities of life. I want us to notice two things. And we'll be out of here. The perplexity, the perplexing enigmas of life review. And the second thing is the personal encouragement of life that is recorded. But notice, notice first of all, the perplexing enigmas of life. If you notice the evil uh, suppression there in verse number nine, and it says, all this I have seen. Now Solomon is saying that I, I've, I've seen this. this. This is not something I've read in the book or something that, that I've heard Dr. Doc, Doc, Johnny come lately say it or, or your, your, your girlfriend, boyfriend said, Solomon said, listen, I, I've, I've seen this and I've applied my heart unto every word that is done under the sun, there is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. Solomon says, I've given my total mind, I've given to the investigation, to this thing, to understand what is God doing. Solomon said, I've given this investigation. God has given Solomon wisdom beyond measure. Even God has given him so much wisdom, even Solomon has made mistakes. As being the wisest man in the world, how can you comprehend having 700 wives, 300 concubines, and each one of them have their own God. They pulled his heart away from God. The kingdom was rent simply because of him falling away from God, but yet he is still considered to be the wisest man that ever walked the planet of, the, uh, of earth, but yet Solomon says here that he made some mistakes. Solomon cannot fathom all of the evil work that is done in the world or the issues of life. If Solomon could under, could not understand them, who are we the better? Uh, I don't think that my knowledge even considers to the knowledge that, that Solomon had. If Solomon had problems figuring out what God is doing, who am I the better to say that I'm able to figure out what God is doing? Amen. How can evil, wicked man oppress the innocent and get away? Now, that's a, that's a, that's a question that we often ask, that we often Act. You know, why does good things, bad things happen to good people? You know, we ask the question, uh, why does it happen? We also ask, how is a wicked man can oppress the innocent and get away with it? And oftentimes I think about Trayvon uh, Martin and, and those that have been uh, brutally murdered by the innocent. You've got uh, whatever, I can't even remember his name, uh, that, that murdered him, but yet now he's just being a tyrant in the world. It almost seemed as if he killed the innocent boy and he got away with it. We often see this today when we see the cops. So we just just everyday life we see uh, the wicked are are destroying the innocent and seem like they're uh, getting away with it. How can evil wicked men oppress the innocent and get away with it? Why does God allow this to happen? Why does bad things happen to good people but I'm here to stand before you this morning to tell you that no matter what happens no matter what befalls us God is still in control God knows what's going on God is the one that sits high and looks low God is the one that's in control God said he didn't give us a spirit of fear but of power and of a sound mind when we say we don't understand, we're, we're not alone. Why does God allow this to take place? Why does God allow wicked, the, the wicked that seems to win, those that undermine God's doing? I think about the LGBT. I think about the HRO. When the fact that we lost those that are believers, those that are children of God, tried to fight the HRO, but yet the wicked prevailed. This was the bathroom bill. If you don't remember several years ago, 
we were trying to fight to get it where the LGBT, those that are, are homosexual, want to go in the bathrooms of whatever sex they think they want it to be. We tried to fight it, but we lost it. I asked the question, how is it that the wicked seems to win? Those that are undermining God's authority, God's plan and purpose for life. But I also have to remind myself that God is the one that's still in control. But notice under the evil suppression, the painful injustice there. I want you to know that God's not asleep. God is in control. Just because the wicked is on the for forefront does not mean that God has lost one iota of control. Just because we are in a pandemic, we are in a crisis, America, the world is in a crisis, does not mean that God has lost one iota of control of this world. But we ask the question, why does he allow it? He allow it for his own purpose, for his own Pleasure is benefit. It is to, to get us to where he wants us to be. Solomon is talking about uh, what it seems uh, that he's heard, what he's seen, not what he's heard, not what he read in the book, not by secondhand information. Solomon is talking about the painful injustices. Notice, let me just turn to it. Don't turn to it. Please ask these chapter 4. Just want to read verse, verse 1. And it says, So I return. And I consider all the oppression that is done under the sun. And behold the tears, such as oppressed, and they had no comforter. And on the side of the oppressed, they had power, but they had no comforter. He said, listen, he's sitting in a court, and he's giving us this, this, this illustration of someone that is innocent. They have no one there to help them. They have no one there to, to represent them. But the wicked, the evil is there, and they have power, and they are there with no one there to represent them. And that's the way it often seems in the world in which we live. Those that are innocent have no one there to comfort them. No one there to tell them that, listen, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. But the wicked has all the power, all the position, all of the wealth. But yet those that are innocent have absolutely nothing. Solomon is saying that there is wicked and evil in the world. But it should not distract us from God's business. That we must be about God's business. If you're taking notes, write down Psalm 73. And get time to read that. Solomon is saying that the wicked will say, you know, you know in, in this text, Solomon is saying, uh, David is saying in Psalms 73, that the wicked will say and do what they please. And then say, God doesn't know. Or what, what is God going to do about it? This is the mindset of most folks today that don't know Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sin. They're going to say and do what they want, do what they please, and say God doesn't see it. God does not know what I'm doing. And oftentimes, we get discouraged. We want to throw in the towel. We want to give up. We want to quit because of situations in life. We have to remember when we're dealing with the perplexing problem, the painful injustices that God is still. In, in control. I often think about the Hebrew boys as they were facing the fire of furnace. Daniel as he was facing the lion's den but the ultimate of all is Jesus Christ who suffered at the hands of wicked men to become sin for this world. That was the greatest injustice of all was Jesus Christ dying at the hand of those that were wicked but yet he died, he came, his purpose was to die for the sins of the world. We see the painful injustices, but notice the poetic justice there. And it says in the latter portion of verse 9, and it says, There is a time wherein that one man ruleth over another and of his own hurt. He said there's a time that, that this is going to occur, but there's going to be a time that one day God is going to judge the wicked. There's a time when you go back to Revelation chapter 6. It talks about the martyr, those that was washed in their in their robes, and they say, "God, how long will you will you uh, 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 go back and defend us?" He said, "This you got to wait a while till the other ones come. Till the other ones are are martyred, we have a time that God's going to allow it to happen. But one day, God's going to wrap it up. Those that are wicked and evil will stand before the judgment of God. They will get the justice that they deserve." We think that they're getting away. But I tell you what, God said, no, they're not getting away. Because one day, they're going to stand before the judgment seat and they're going to receive their reward. Amen. Their justice for their evil 
And God is saying that there will be a time for just as you remember the story of Jezebel and Ahab, when Ahab took the, the, the vineyard from Naboth and then nothing happened. It was 20 years later before God came and judged uh, a J J uh, Jezebel and Ahab. They, they thought that they, they had gotten away with it, but justice may be slow, but it's sure. God may not judge you immediately, but he will, even though the just the wheels of justice grind slowly, but they grind surely. One day, the wicked shall stand, and they shall give an account. Many of them think that they've gotten away with it. it I, I just wrote down there a P.S., but God, but God knows all things. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27, I got to read that. And it says, Whoso diggeth a, a, a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it shall return unto him. He's talking about the ultimate uh, retribution of the evil is certain. It's, a, it's almost saying, if you go out and dig a ditch, you know, for someone else, you better be careful, because the ditch might be for you. I remember my grandma said, go out and fight a battle, you better dig two graves. Because you might not be the one that wins. God is saying that his justice is, <clears throat> is sure to come. You try to go out and do harm to someone else, try to kill somewhere, but the pit that you designed for them is for you. You go back to, was it Esther and, and Haman? He built the gallows. The, the kid, and all of a sudden he was hung on the same gallows that he made for someone else. And oftentimes God is saying for the wicked and evil, the pit that they make for you, they better be careful because it may be the pit that they made for them for themselves. God is not mob. We also reap what we sow. But God is still in control. We see that's the poetic justice. But notice the evil supremacy there in verse 10 and 11. Life is filled with problems. If you have not started living, we got a lot of young people, but the young people might not understand this that my grandmother used to always say, keep it. Life is filled with problems. Solomon had studied them firsthand, and Solomon uh, pondered why God continues to allow the wicked to, to prosper. It almost seemed to us that the wicked are prospering, but the innocent are not, or the rich get richer, and the poor. Get, get poor. Solomon is pondering this, this, this thought, but notice the sure removal there, verse 10. And it says, and so I saw the wicked buried. Solomon is said, well, basically, I'm at a funeral. He said, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holy, and they were forgotten in the place where they had so done. This is also a, a vanity. Solomon point to the sovereignty of of God and so Solomon points to as he's looking to a funeral he says there's someone there that's there that has passed away he said he had been to the holy that means maybe he's a person that's been to church in and out of, of church Solomon says one day he dies and then you are forgotten it's a pitiful thing that you God has given you life health and strength you live life apart from God you die go to hell and you turn around and you're forgotten you know, and, and that's going to be the case when a lot of these folks pass away. You, they're going to be forgotten. One day they're going to say, Kobe Bryant, who? Oprah Winfrey, who? Tyler Perry, who? One day when we die, they all shall be forgotten. But we ought to be like the great Martin Luther King, the one that we always remember. There's a a day for him. When I leave this earth, I want them to always remember that Ronnie Edwards stood for something. He was a preacher. He stood for this. I want my name to be remembered. If not remembered for the founding of the church, he made a stand for justice, but many will die and simply be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Ask some of these kids about Elvis Presley. Elvis who? Who Elvis? Who is Elvis? Who is Elvis? He's forgotten. This is what Solomon here is, is saying. There's a sure 
removal is sad to live life in ungodly life, ungodly life and die, and then you are forgotten. And many die, and they have a high proof of funeral, and they still forgotten. And what saddens me, and what really upsets me, when somebody have a, and I, I'm not calling no name, but they, they have a wicked life, a life that they show that they're not serving God, but when they die, they want to deify them, they want to magnify them as if they're the best thing since sliced bread. I'm talking about these performers and all these folks that are so-called famous. When they die, they want to deify them and magnify them, but when they were alive, they did absolutely nothing for the kingdom of God. And yet we want to worship them when they die. But when they die one day, the text says they shall be forgotten. Not only the sure removal, but notice the speedy retribution in verse 11. And it says, because the sentence against the evil is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is, is fully set in them that do, do evil. We have, a, even in our own judicial system today, what, what we have is what we call a speedy trial. You know, that's, it, that's not always speedy, but it's supposed to be a, a speedy uh, trial. If we, if we allow evil to continue, and we do absolutely nothing, we do not intervene to stop it, it will cause others to carry out the same crime because they see that absolutely nothing has happened, there's nothing going to happen to me, I'm going to do the same thing because they didn't get a punishment, neither should I. If you got two kids in a house, if one does it, you don't punish them, I guarantee you the other one is going to do the same thing because he already knows he's not going to get in trouble. That's the way the world is to today when most of this didn't happen for me. Because see, when I was growing up, it wasn't waiting your daddy get home. Mama them beat the brakes off you right then, right there. But most folks say, wait till your daddy get home. Then when daddy gets home, guess what? Don't nothing happen. The child grows up believing that your word does not. If you tell a child you're going to spank them, you got to spank them. Even if you don't want to, principle, you got to still spank them. Because if you don't and you said you would, they're going to think that now what you say is not real. Now, I guess when we get older, we get softer. You know, because you know, I, I listen to my mom and them and kids here, and they talk about that. She ain't had no problem whooping me. She didn't whoop me in her sleep. It didn't even matter. You know, but now as we get older, I guess it's the difference. It's the difference between children, between Ronnie and Nicholas. There's a difference. You know, Ronnie, I can be him with ease. It's hard to whoop Nicholas. I guess when we get older, Things begin to change. I don't know if this happened to y'all. Maybe it's just me. But it gets a little harder as we get older. But he's saying that whatever we say, we have to do. Children grow up and believe that it's never done. See, you can't just threaten these millennials. You got to show them. Because if you've grown up and they've grown up with this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but we, but it's never, it's, it's, it's never done. God does not allow uh, uh, sin. God, listen, he, he is appalled to sin, but listen very carefully. God does not always deal with sin swiftly. You might ask the question, well, why not? It's because of God's grace. It's because of, of God's Mercy is because of God's love. God extends his, his justice and his judgment in order for you to have the time to come to know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sin. When I made the first mistake, if God would have wiped me out, I would have died and went to a devil's hell. But it's because of God's grace, his long suffering, that he allowed me to live in order for me to come to know Jesus Christ in the pardon of my sin. It's God's grace that he does not move swiftly. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. What if God operated that, that way today? You lied to me, bam, you're dead. Bring in the other one. I asked the question, you lied, bam, you're dead. Heck up the feet of the men that's coming to take you away. They took them both away and buried them. Justice was immediately. But we see God's grace and we see God's mercy. God does not always uh, deal with sin swiftly. We can go to 2 Peter uh, 3.9 says the Lord 
is not slight concerning his promises, as some men count slightness, but his long suffering to us for is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, that they all should come to the saving grace. God does not execute judgment immediately. It is it is not swiftly, simply because of God's grace and his mercy. God allows us to, to get it right. You know, God is going to judge us, but it's not that, that judgment of taking us out of this, this world. God does not judge us that way because of his love and his grace. So we see the sure removal, the speedy ret retribution. We look at the evil surmise and the, the evil supremacy, but notice the eternal uh, standard there, verse 12 and 13, in God's time in the wicked shall be judged and the innocent shall be rewarded. That's enough to make a Baptist shout. Everybody here should have jumped up, stopped shouting, and don't don't touch nobody now. But just run around. Don't you can't high five each other, hit him in the back, and you do all that no more, because we can't do that. But yet everybody should have jumped that one day. God is going to judge the wicked and he's going to reward the righteous. But notice the reward there in verse 12. And it says, though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his day be prolonged. That means he keep on doing it. But yet, surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he feareth not before God. He says here the reward a hundred times. He is speaking of continual. He simply says if a man continual to sin and his days are extended, he lives a long life, a prosperous, prosperous life. This is what he's, he's saying. He lives a long life. The sinner does evil continually and they continue to do evil and they live a long life. They will be judged and the righteous shall still be rewarded. They may live a long life. They, they may live to be 80, 90 years old. They may live to be quite billionaires or, or trillionaires. They'll live a long, prosperous life. But one day, they've got to stand before the judge of this universe and they shall be judged. Amen. They didn't get away with it. We often think that those that have, have murdered and those that have done things to their kids and they've gotten away with it because they had not got caught by humanity. But God's eyes see everything and they must stand and they're going to receive their reward, their, their judgment. But notice the retribution there. And it says, when you see the wicked as living long and prosperous, powerful in position, but he will not live forever. I want you to listen to that. They may have power. They may have prestige. They may have wealth. But i tell you one thing that they don't have. They don't have eternality. One day, they're going to die. Just like the rich man in Lazarus. He fared sumptuously every day. He was well, but he said one day, they both died. It's the great equalizer. Death is the one thing that's going to happen to each and every one of us. We shall die. These rich folks that think they've gotten away, think that they live in life. One day each one of them shall die. And when they die, they shall stand before the judgment seat of God to receive their, their re rewards. It says we see the wicked as they live in long and prosperous and powerful life, but they will not live forever in God's judgment will be sure. Proverbs chapter 10, 10 and 27. Proverbs 10 and 27. Let me read that one. 10 and 27. It says, The fear of the Lord prolong his days, but the years of the wicked shall be short. It appears to us that they live long, but God said that their days shall be, their days shall be short. He says, like a a shadow, you know, when you out and the sun shines, you see the shadow is there. Next thing you move, the next thing the sun moves, the shadow is gone. It's only there for a minute. He said that this is the life of the wicked. It's only there for a minute. It may seem that they're there for a long time, but God says it shall be cut off. All that have have life, listen, they will not live forever. He said, but we. Yeah, didn't, this is enough to make a, a Baptist shout, but they shall not live forever. They're going to die. They're going to stand before the judgment seat of God. They shall receive their reward, which is this place called hell. But we as believers, 
as children of God, we will spend all of eternity with God in heaven. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 talks about us throwing down our crown as we stand in heaven, as we sing to the Lord, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. We have forward to looking forward to our living with the Lord in heaven for all of eternity. But they have looking for the retribution of God when they are placed in the devil's hell. They did not get away with it because 80 years does not does not have no bearing on eternity. I would rather spend eternity with the Lord and be 80 years and have to suffer and die broke and spend eternity with God than to be wealthy and rich and spend all of eternity in this place called hell. Amen. Because one day you're going to die and you're going to stand before that judgment seat of God and God is going to judge you. But the child of God, we have consolation knowing the last trump shall sound and Jesus is going to return and we're going to return with him. And the scripture says we shall be, have all of eternity forever with the Lord in the air. That's the retribution of the wicked, but then there's the, there's the reward of the righteous. So he's saying that, don't, don't worry about it. Now, don't worry about it. I wish Teresa was here as I was preaching this text. I was, I was thinking about her. We don't have to worry about what someone does us wrong. You don't have to worry about it. You know, God said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Someone has done you wrong. You guarantee you, God is going to make them pay. It is not for us to make them pay, but let God handle it. If they've done you wrong, just remember one day they got to stand before the judgment seat of God. The vengeance is mine, said that when God is his good, he's a good judge. And he knows how to dispense his justice correctly. Notice the enigma stated there, verse 14. And it said, This is vanity which is done upon the earth, and there be just men upon whom it happened according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happened according to the work of the righteous. And I said that this is also vanity. Notice under the enigma there, the contradiction there. He said that which that which the wicked gets should be for the righteous, and that which the righteous get should be for the wicked. It seems like it's a contradiction. The things that the the, the wicked get, we look at that. Those are things that the righteous ought to get, and the things that the righteous get, it appears to be those are the things that the wicked ought to get. There's a contradiction here, but the text says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Yeah. Psalms 37 and 1 said, Fret not yourself uh, because of evildoers, because they soon shall be cut down. You don't have to worry about it. Don't fret yourself and those that do evil because they soon shall be cut down. They soon shall receive their just reward for their evil deeds so you don't have to worry about it. God is going to take care of it. Notice the comfort there. Jesus Christ became sin for us. The greatest contradiction of all was one that knew no sin, did no sin. He became sin for us. In other words, his, his, his righteousness was placed on us and our sin was placed on him. It is just what Solomon is is saying that what you think the righteous should get, the wicked get. That what you think Jesus Christ would have. He took our sin and we took his righteousness. That ought to be a comfort for the child of God. John 3.16, God so loved the word that he gave his only begotten son to whomsoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow, but yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. His chastisement of his peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We're talking about a spiritual healing, not a physical healing. By his stripes we are Heal. We're talking about the perplexity uh, of life. We look at the perplexing enigma of life review, but I want us to notice that secondly, the last thing is the personal encouragement of life recorded there in verses 13 through 17. Now, Solomon is, is giving us the, 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 
the, the outlook. And now Solomon says that we, rather than focus on the problem, we must realize that God is in control. Mm -hmm. yeah. Instead of focusing on the problem, we have to realize that God is in control. Instead of telling God about how big our problem is, we need to start telling our problem how big our God is. Yeah. Knowing that God is in control, and I know that it's a scary time for everybody. Now everybody is that got good sense. It is cautious, but we still got to understand that God still holds the world in His in His hand. But notice the situation at verse fifteen. Verse fifteen, and it reads: Then I commended mirth, because a man has no better thing under the sun than to eat, drink, be merry that he shall abide men to stay with him for his labor of the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. Now this does not mean <coughs> excuse me that Solomon is saying just forget about it, I'm just going to eat, drink, be merry. That is not what he's saying at all. He's not saying that we're just going to be nonchalant about it, I don't care no more, we just, I'm just going to do this because I'm, I don't care. That is simply not what, what he's saying. He's simply saying we need to stop worrying about the evilness and we need to enjoy the blessings of God. I understand that we may be in lockdown. You may be in lockdown, you still can enjoy the blessings of God. You're there with your husband, your wife, you're there with your kids. Even if you're home alone, you still can enjoy the blessings of God. Instead of focusing on the problem, we need to focus and enjoy the fact that God is the one that's in control. Regardless of the problem, we ought to give God the praise. Psalm 34 and 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. The word magnify means to make bigger. It makes bigger. How can we make God bigger? We need to magnify Him. We need to tell folks about Him. It says, as long as I have breath in my body, I will give praise to God. Regardless of the situation that we're going through, we still need to give God the praise. So many people are ungrateful for life. So many people are simply ungrateful for life, health, and strength. Many live life without any thought of giving God any credit until they stand before the camera and they say, first, I want to give honor to God. But your life does not exemplify anything of God. A lot of these folks, first thing they want to happen, oh, they went to Del, yeah, they went to church. And, yeah, he had just left church. Yeah, he well, died, he just left church. You know, but yet you've never shown that you've done anything for the kingdom of God. But when they die, we want to glorify and deify them. But it says we need to stop worrying. We need to stop worrying about the situation at hand, the situation that we are under now, because God is the one that's in control. Not only the situation, but notice the satisfaction there. Verse 16 and 17. He said, Then I beheld all the works of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun because though a man labors to seek it out yet he shall not find it yea further though a wise man thinks he know it yet shall he not be able to find it Solomon here is saying in his satisfaction here his central satisfaction here after searching diligently he said, I applied, that means I investigated my mind to gain wisdom and to observe man's activities. He concluded that man is ignorant to the work of God. That simply means that some things are going to happen in life that we cannot understand. And this might be one of them now. It's COVID-19. It might be something that we cannot understand. He's trying to figure out where it come from or how it works. But we have to understand certain things that we just do not understand. God said, listen, Solomon is saying, don't worry about it. Don't sit there and worry about it because we know that God is in control. Now we have to take all the teaching that we've been taught. Now we have to bring it into fruition that we can live by it while we're in this pandemic. See, all the stuff that we've learned, we got to start living by now. Right. You know, we say, Lord, Lord, as long as, as, long as I got blood running up one of you, my baby. See, now we got to start living by exactly what we've learned in the Bible. We have to start living by faith. 
We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but we know who holds tomorrow. I'm going to have faith even if I can't see a cure. Even if I don't know, I'm still going to have faith. Isaiah 55 and 9, I'm done. He said, for the heavens are higher than the earth, and for uh, my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than yours. In other words, God is saying, you don't even understand nothing. You can go back and look at Job. Job never understood what God was saying. We don't understand everything that God is doing. But you have so many folks that claim they know, claim they know more than God. They know how we got here. There was a big bang and there was a mutation. When the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. God is the one that created everything after their lifetime. God is the creator. But you got folks that think they know more than God. But God ways are not our ways. A man cannot understand what God is, is doing. A person that thinks he knows everything is headed for destruction. Let me say it again. A person that thinks he knows everything is headed for destruction. Yeah. Don't worry about what's taking place. God is God. And God is in control. And we should be fully satisfied and rest assured in God's control. You can stay up and you can worry day and night. He said his eyes never see it sleep. Solomon said he was up day, night, day, night, trying to figure this thing out. The Bible says God slumbers, nor does he sleep. Some things we can't figure out, we need to go to bed and let God handle it. There's nothing that we can do about it. God has given us good sense that we ought to do what the, the folks up there in Washington have said we ought to do. And wash your hands, you know, make sure you don't touch your face, try to not to be in too much in contact with other folks. But yet some folks still are going to live their lives, but we have to be smart about it. But yet all I want to say is that God is in control. See, just because we get a distraction, we can't forget about God's business. Amen. Just because we got a distraction, just because we have a, a problem, we still can't just vacate and, and just abandon the work of the Lord because of what the world says. Even if we have in church from home, we still have, have church. I'm, thank, I'm so thankful for the technology that we have today. What if this would have happened 20 years ago? It wouldn't have been no church. I don't know how many folks can get on the telephone together. I mean, you click over and only two people. But yet, we couldn't have the technology. We couldn't have the service. We have a whole service from home. So we have to remember that God is in con is in control listening i want to close with this scripture matthew 11 28 29 and 30. it says come unto me all that labor and are uh, and are of a heavy labor and i shall give you rest. take my yoke upon you and learn of me for i am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your soul take my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is I'm not going to open the door of the church because we're all here as believers.